Hi, I'm Andy, and welcome to my walkthrough of the 2020 Sans Holiday hack. Our final objective is to investigate some changes that Jack Frost made to the Naughty Nice blockchain to award himself a super high nice score. First, we'll go see Tangle, who will provide some hints, but only if we're able to beat the snowball game on impossible difficulty level. Let's play some games on easy to start with. The snowball game seems to be a battleships clone. Each move is submitted over a web socket, and it's the server side which controls the flow of play and determines whether snowballs hit or miss the targets. The AI appears to be pretty dumb, and it's quite easy to beat it. Let's try another game on medium setting. The AI definitely acts a bit smarter, although after a while it looks like the targets we need to hit are placed in exactly the same location as the easy mode game. This lines up with one of Tangle's suggestions, that the layer of the forts is calculated based off of the player's name. The game must be using a pseudo-random number generator, or PRNG for short, to determine the fort placement. Numbers produced by a PRNG might look random, but are actually derived from a very predictable formula. This formula takes a seed as an input to initialise it, and in this game it appears that the player name is used as the seed. So, using the same player name results in the same seed, which results in the same board placement. With some memory of the previous board, it's fairly easy to beat the game on medium despite its slightly smarter AI. On hard mode, the option to specify the player name is greyed out, and can't be tricked by temporarily choosing an easier mode to set this field. The randomly chosen player name is however displayed on the screen. That means it's possible to copy it over to a separate browser session, running another instance of the snowball game, and input it into the player name field on easy mode. We already know it's trivial to beat easy mode, and the knowledge of the fort placement in this mode can be directly translated over to the hard mode game. Things get trickier in impossible mode. No longer is the player name visible, and also the AI seems to be absolutely perfect. It scores a hit every single shot. To have any chance of beating it, the human player must also be 100% perfect and take advantage of the fact that the human takes the first shot. So, how can we gain knowledge of the game board in this mode? The pre-game description states that a few hundred pseudo-randomly generated numbers are thrown away before picking the actual one that is then used as the player name, and hence the seed for the main PRNG to determine the board placement. But instead of being silently dropped, those discarded player names are instead printed in the source code as comments. It's not obvious what programming language is used on the back end, but regardless, it's likely to be using a Mersenne twister for the PRNG, as this is the most commonly used algorithm. And, as Tom Liston explained in his KringleCon talk this year, given enough numbers from a Mersenne twister PRNG, it's possible to then recreate the internal state of the algorithm in a separate local instance, and then be able to calculate the next numbers to be generated. He's even made some code available on GitHub to do exactly this. So, we just need to take that list of rejected numbers, store them in a file, and then tweak Tom's sample code to read these in. Once complete, this code can be run, and it then spits out the next few numbers. The first of these is what should have been selected as the player name for this game. Like before, we can then feed this into a separate instance running on easy mode in order to determine the board placement, and then use that knowledge to play a perfect game and beat the computer on impossible difficulty mode. Now, whilst this is probably the intended way of solving this puzzle, there is a much simpler alternative, which may be an accidental mistake left over from when the game was developed. A bit of podding and proking around in the web traffic uncovers a cookie which gets set at the start of the game. It looks like base64, so let's chuck it in Cyberchef to decode. The output is just a bunch of binary, and that's where I probably would have just left this one if it weren't for an awesome feature of Cyberchef which I never noticed before until this puzzle. 
just above the output window, a magic wand has appeared, and hovering over it produces a kind suggestion that this appears to be compressed data. So, let's drag over the inflate operation, and voila, it's a dump of the game board. This cookie is set regardless of game mode, so with this knowledge we can again beat the game on impossible mode. Anyway, regardless of which method is used, Tangle is impressed and provides some hints for the main objective. This final question, split into two parts, involves investigating a discrepancy on the Naughty Nice blockchain which Santa uses to keep track of naughty and nice behaviour over the year. Somehow, Jack Frost has managed to reach the top of the Nice leaderboard with an unfathomably high score. This is mainly down to a single super nice event, which seemingly occurred all the way back in March, although there's many witnesses who state that Jack's score was actually negative only a few weeks ago from today. A blockchain consists of blocks of data, and each block includes a cryptographically secure hash of the previous block's data. This creates the chain part of blockchain, and means that any change to a block's contents results in a different hash. The altered block and all subsequent blocks are then considered invalid. So, despite the supposed security of blockchain, Jack appears to have found a way to manipulate a block without causing any validation errors. And a look at the naughty nice blockchain code reveals the likely vulnerability. The hash of each block is calculated using the MD5 algorithm, which has long been considered insecure due to the ease of calculating collisions, where two or more similar inputs produce the same hash as an output. Perhaps this wasn't seen as a big issue, given that the Naughty Nice blockchain does have an additional security feature to help prevent collisions from being intentionally engineered. A randomly generated nonce is included in every block, and therefore in every hash calculation. Creating a collision requires knowledge of this value, but it's only generated when new data is added to the block. Line 182 of the Naughty Nice blockchain code shows that this nonce is generated by Python's random library, which of course is a pseudo-random number generator, meaning it is not suitable for use in any security application. The documentation for this function indicates that it's a Mersenne twister, just like we saw with the Snowball game. So, this is where Objective 11a comes in. Given knowledge of the previous nonces on the blockchain, is it possible for someone to predict a future nonce? Along with the Python code for the Naughty Nice blockchain, we're provided with a chunk of the blockchain itself, from index positions 128449 to 129996 a total of 1,548 blocks, and therefore 1,548 nonces. We saw in the previous section that we only need a few hundred values, 624 to be precise, in order to determine the internal state of a Mersenne twister. The nonces can be extracted with some simple code like this. Note that the nonces used in the blockchain are 64-bit numbers but the Mersenne twister only works with 32-bit values, so that needs to be accounted for as part of an update to Tom Liston's PRNG predictor code. It's not obvious exactly how Python chooses to generate 64-bit random numbers from a 32-bit PRNG, but it's probably a good guess that it simply generates two 32-bit values and glues them together. So, the 64-bit nonces from the blockchain need splitting in half before untempering the PRNG. Again, it's not immediately obvious which order these two 32-bit values occur in, so we just need to make a guess and give it a try. Only 312 64-bit nonces are needed to untemper the 624 32-bit values necessary. So that means that 1236 still remain in the input file, and can be used to verify whether the values now being produced by the replicated PRNG match those from the original, and thus verify if the assumption about the order of the 32-bit values is correct. Once the end of the file is reached, 
this code will then create 10 further 64-bit nonces. Let's give it a spin. It looks like the PRNG state was successfully determined, as the generated values match those in the remainder of the input file. So the next 10 nonces should also be correct. We're required to provide the nonce for block 130,000, so that's this one here. The answer is required in hex, but once converted, can be submitted to the badge to pick up the achievement. So it is indeed possible to predict future nonces for this blockchain. Now to dig deeper and try and find out what Jack has actually changed. We're given the SHA-256 hash of the block that he altered, and also told that he changed just 4 bytes. Let's find that block he altered. First, we'll need to add a function to the naughty nice blockchain code to calculate the SHA-256 hash of a block. And then print it out for each block. Then run the updated code, pipe the output through grep, and search for the last few digits of that SHA-256 hash. Jack altered block number 129459. Given that the chunk of blockchain we're working with starts at block 128449, that means that Jack's altered block resides at index number 1010 in the Python array within the Naughty Nice script. With another update to the Naughty Nice code, we can examine that block. We can also extract the entire block using the save a block function. First off, it's way bigger than any of the other blocks in this chain. It also states that some 4 billion plus nice points were awarded to person ID 12FD1. Uh, presumably this is Jack Frost. This block contains two documents, which can be extracted with the dump doc function. One is just a small chunk of seemingly junk binary data. The other is a PDF but its file size is again quite large considering it's just a text-based report of supposedly nice behaviour by Jack Frost. We were told in the question that only 4 bytes have changed in this block, but how could just 4 altered bytes lead to both a vastly different score and presumably a different content in the PDF file? After all, the score field alone is a 4-byte integer. One possibility is that the score itself has not been changed, but perhaps just the naughty nice indicator, which is just a single byte, has been flipped. Perhaps in the original version of this block, Jack didn't have a 4 billion nice score, but a 4 billion naughty score. Such an extreme naughty score is just as surprising as an extreme nice score, so let's see if there's any other clues we can uncover. Before turning to the PDF report, it's useful to recap that PDFs are formed from a series of numbered objects, such as pages, fonts, text, images, etc., and references between those objects to form a tree. Angie Albertini has some great explanations of this on his GitHub page, so do go check out his work if you're interested in further details. We can examine the PDF file from Jack's altered block in more detail with PDF Parser. This produces a report of all those individual objects which make up the PDF file. It's a little hard to see the relationships in text form, so here's the same information transposed manually into a graph. Now it's clear to see that there's two completely separate page structures, and one is often from the document root. The objects which form this lower page structure still exist in the PDF file, but because they are not referenced from the document roots, they are never displayed. This is a scenario that Angie again describes in more detail, and specifically in the context of hash collisions. By changing just one byte in this file, the reference in the catalogue to point to the pages object with ID3 instead of the pages object with ID2, a completely different document will be rendered. Let's open up the PDF file in a hex editor and do exactly that. The alternative content hidden in this PDF file describes a situation where Jack travelled to Australia, kicked a wombat, and then, feigning remorse, convinced Shinny to upload the incident with the maximum number of naughty points. But it seems like he also engineered some sort of technical issue to prevent Shinny from uploading the report straight away, and promising that he'd do it himself. 
but instead he must have used this opportunity to hide his own nice report into this PDF and construct the rest of the block in such a way that a hash collision would not only be possible, but also align perfectly to alter the content. This course of events backs up the earlier theory that the one byte naughty nice indicator has been flipped in this block, rather than adjusting the scalar value of the score. So it appears that just two one byte values need to be changed in order to toggle between the naughty and the nice versions of this block. But there's still the block hash to contend with in order to maintain the validity of the blockchain. For that, we'll need to take another slight detour to more of Angie Albertini's great work, this time his presentation and workshop on hash collisions. He explains several different flavours of collision, but for our purposes we'll focus on the Unicol variant, as this is specifically mentioned in his earlier work relating to hiding different documents within a single PDF. MD5 operates on its input data in chunks of 512 bits or 64 bytes. A Unicol collision involves the creation of two chunks of data which exhibit an important property. It's possible to alter the tenth byte of each chunk, incrementing one and decrementing the other, and the end result produces the same MD5 hash. These two Unicol chunks can be part of much larger blocks of data, and so long as none of the other bytes change, the MD5s will also remain the same. Armed with this intuition, it's now possible to put all the pieces of this attack together. To do so, here's the entirety of the block jack altered, loaded up into a hex editor. We can see the various block fields, followed by the first document, the small binary data file, and then the second document, the PDF report. The MD5 hash can be checked from the tools menu of this editor. It's also useful to highlight the MD5 chunk boundaries. Note the position of the sign byte which determines whether the score is treated as naughty or nice. It's the tenth byte of an MD5 chunk. Altering this from nice to naughty is a decrement of one. So, if there were a unical collision present here, we would expect an increment of one on this byte here, the tenth byte of the subsequent MD5 chunk. This byte is within the content of the small binary file which forms document number one. And now the purpose of this document becomes clear. This is the data which has been calculated by the collision algorithm as that which is necessary to engineer the collision. By defining this as a separate document in the blockchain, Jack has ensured that these values do not interfere with any aspect of the chain's operation. After performing the decrement and increment, the MD5 can be recalculated, and it's exactly the same. We found our collision. It's a similar story for the byte in the PDF, which selects the other document tree. This too lines up exactly on the tenth byte boundary, except this time the first byte is an increment from 2 to 3. So that means that this byte here needs to be decremented. The collision engineering bytes this time fall within the comment section of the page object, so again do not have an adverse impact on the document. The hash can be verified once more, and again it's the same as the original. These are the four bytes that Jack altered in the blockchain to convert the original naughty report of his behaviour into a nice report, having engineered two separate MD5 collisions. To complete this objective, we can use the tool to calculate the SHA-256 hash of this modified block and submit it to our badge to pick up the achievement. With Jack Frost now well and truly busted, we can jump back through the painting one final time and head back up to Santa's office to receive some words of thanks and to pick up the final piece of narrative to complete our badge. This brings a close to this year's holiday hack so all that's left is to share a big thank you to Ed Scudis and the teams at Counterhack and Sans for putting on yet another fantastic event. Don't forget that the game servers stay running for several years, so if you didn't get a chance to do any of the challenges but want to have a go, just head on over to the link in the video description. And if you're still in need of a little more cybersecurity content, feel free to check out some of my other videos. 
Otherwise, I wish you a very happy and healthy 2021, and I'll see you next year for more Holiday Hack Adventures.